Carrie, one of the things that I've come to know about you is very early on, you had a passion for athletics and yes. performing for sports. What was your first sports that you were involved in? Yeah. Well, I mean, it goes back so early. Um, you know, my dad was a great athlete and he was the division one athlete. And just early on, I was, my parents have stories about how I was six months old and I would sit and watch an entire Creighton basketball game. They're like, you were literally six months old. You wouldn't make a peep. You wouldn't ask for food. You literally sat there and you watched the ball like back and forth, back and forth. So I think just at an early age, I was fascinated with like sports and movement and um, you know, so I grew up, played everything. I mean, soccer was technically the first organized sport that I played, but I loved baseball, basketball, football. And so eventually got into that and was just like obsessive, you know, like I'm the type that like, I hated school. I didn't want anything to do with school unless it was a gym, but I just loved sports. And so kind of this like transition of how I actually became super passionate about movement is it got to a point like maybe junior high or even even sooner maybe like fifth sixth seventh grade I started to become really obsessed with like training for sports so like I got into like lifting weights or you know just working out and I just became I wanted to be like the one who was in the best shape so like for basketball you know I was a little I wasn't like the most talented person, but I played high school basketball and it was more because I just was in shape. I hustled my ass off and it was like, okay, if you're in the best shape, you can play defense. You can do all these things that like that help you. So um, the first time that I remember, I remember I was like in grade school and I was at a bookstore. So for you kids watching this who we used to have books <laughs> and we used to have to go to bookstores to like learn shit or the library. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't YouTube. Right. And so you had to actually like find the book and read it and look at it. And I remember this book, it was called like condition the NBA way. And I just was like, Oh, this is so cool. It shows you like how to work out and what to do. And, and that was like the first time I realized it was not just about sports. It was like, I loved athletic performance. So, so. when you talk about, being in tip-top shape yeah. are we talking about endurance or are you talking about muscle strength and conditioning yeah that's a good question i mean i think um i think as a kid i didn't know the difference right like i didn't know there's a difference between like explosiveness and strength and you know th there's just there's just different things right like a bodybuilder you think a bodybuilder is like strong, but no, like an Olympic weightlifter is strong or a powerlifter is strong, right? But a bodybuilder is different, like the hypertrophy, the like build, building of the body. And then, you know, even like with something like fighting, like MMA is a sport that I spent a lot of time in, I trained and I, and I love. And when you look at fighting again, you, you see a, like a per person who looks like a bodybuilder, you're like, holy shit, that's a scary dude. No, the dude who is very unassuming but has crazy endurance and crazy explosiveness is going to kick the shit out of the bodybuilder right <laughs> so like you start to realize like wow like things aren't as they seem and so i think i was first as a kid passionate about like getting muscle and look trying to look like you were strong or look like you were in shape but i think as things progressed i started to understand explosiveness and i started to understand strength and and i kind of liked all of them to be honest but I more gravitated way more towards performance, athletic performance and strength and conditioning versus like bodybuilding, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Where'd that lead you? Uh, to fucking nowhere. <laughs> no, no. Rabbit holes. <laughs> Rabbit holes. Where'd that lead you? Oh, where do you want to go with this? Um, so was that so, something you progressed then? Yeah. So... Um, this actually bring, brings me, okay, so there's a couple things I want to talk about here, actually. So hold that thought, because there's something I want There's something I want to put in here right now. So, you know, so I'm a big fan of golf. I know golf is boring for a lot of people, but there's been this movement in the last three or four years, or maybe five years. Tiger Woods was the first golfer to look like an athlete, like to look in shape. Like he doesn't have a beer gut, like the guy looks like an athlete, right? He started lifting weights. He started working on his body. And then in the last three or four years, uh, there's a guy named Bryson DeChambeau who was this like skinny guy who was a good pro golfer and then became like jacked and became an even better golfer. But it's one of those things where I think there's this huge misconception and I see it in golf, especially I see it in his story. 
it worked for him, but in my opinion, he's, he, he went about it like the wrong way. Like he said, okay, I weigh 180 pounds or 190 pounds and I'm going to get up to 240 and I'm going to swing as hard as I can and hit the golf ball as far as I can. And, and it worked for him. Good for him. But the thing is, like I, I've looked at his training. I've talked about his training with different people and I think it's all wrong. So from the standpoint of this is where you have to understand explosiveness and power is totally different than mass. Right. And so I think like for a golfer who wants to improve their game, who wants to hit the ball as far as they can, who wants to, you know, be, become a great golfer, which is funny to some people, because a lot of people don't think golfers are athletes, but golf is like a, th a thing where there's more and more great athletes getting into it. So there's a huge difference between explosiveness and, and power versus mass. So Bryson DeChambeau is an example of somebody who put on a bunch of mass. So by default, as your mass increases, you're going to increase your power. But it's not really what we should be looking at is like an Olympic weightlifter, like an Olympic weightlifter has to weigh a certain amount. So they don't want to put on mass or if they do, they have to stay within a weight class or an Olympic wrestler or a UFC fighter. They don't want to put on a lot of mass or if they're putting on mass, it's restricted to the weight class. So explosiveness is like cleaning and jerking, snatching, kettlebells, medicine balls. It's, a, it's explosive movements, and those explosive movements are actually going to help a, gol a golfer hit a ball way further than just gaining weight. And so I think there's this, like, misconception of, like, oh, if I just put on mass, I'm going to be strong and explosive, and that's not always the case. Bodybuilders generally aren't always that strong. They're just trying to have hypertrophy, and they're going to get stronger, especially if they're using steroids. But athletes, you can take a person who doesn't gain a lot of weight – and they increase their power and they increase their explosiveness tremendously. And again, the best example that I have is wrestlers and Olympic weightlifters where they, they're restricted. So anyway, neither here nor there, but it's something that like, I think is important for people to understand that there's a huge difference between explosiveness, which again is Olympic weightlifting, power, which might be power lifting, such as like you know squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, and then hypertrophy, which is just making your, your muscles bigger. And those things are all very different. And the average person is so confused because they don't know what to do. At so, what age did you recognize the difference? Yeah. So for me, I started to recognize the difference in high school. Um, in high school, I was first really into bodybuilding. And then I got into MMA, mixed martial arts, towards the end of my uh, high school career. And, of course, being strong and strength training helped with injury prevention and it helped being strong. But I realized okay, this isn't actually how I should be training. Because if I want to be in a certain weight class, I need to not gain mass. And if I want to get better at the sport, I actually need explosiveness and power, not body mass. And so I first started learning about it in, in the end of high school and then like beginning of college. And then that's when I started doing some Olympic weightlifting, some more explosiveness stuff. And I realized that naturally I was very much better at explosiveness type stuff versus power or versus, you know, the hypertrophy type movements. And that explosiveness translated directly into athletic performance. And so there's something called like the triple extension, which is essentially your ankles, knees, hips. Like whether you throw a baseball, whether you throw a punch, whether you shoot a basketball, like any movement, any athletic movement, swinging a golf club, like you, you name the athletic movement and you're going to have a triple extension. The power has to come from the flex the, the, the flexation of your ankles, your knees, and your hips. And so what are movements that train your ankles, knees, and hips? Well, all Olympic lifts, you have to get that power to move the bar and, uh, or excuse me, the explosiveness to move the bar. And then in the power lifting movements, you're also, you know, creating power. So explosiveness and power are going to much more translate to athletic performance depending on the sport than the hypertrophy type bodybuilding movements. So Understand. anyway, yeah. So you talked about your dad being a, a D1 athlete. Yes. What was his influence on your... I mean, yeah, so I mean, I think I, I was just always a rant, like, that was a, a common bond that we had, you know, like, we both love sports, and, and, you know, he was a very intense, you know, it's funny, because people meet him, and he's, like, pretty laid back, but, like, when it comes to sports, he's super intense, um, and so I think I certainly got the intensity from from him on, <laughs> on, on that side, um, but I mean, as far as, far as like, you know, I'll try to kind of like get into, I'll try to like kind of work into my story here. So if I look at my story and kind of what got me to, you know, where I am right now, it, it really starts with 
as a kid, I always had a huge passion for athletic performance and for optimization. And I didn't really know the word optimization, but I've always had a passion for optimization. And so it started off as athletic performance. And then I got really fascinated with the human body and, and uh, strength and conditioning and, you know, looking a certain way, but also performing a certain way. And so I was always passionate about that and I loved working out and I, and I kind of got my first taste of nutrition in, in college for the first time. I didn't realize how horrible my diet was and I had a kind of a mentor who started to just sort of un, help me understand proteins, carbs, fats, calories, like basic, basic, basic stuff. And it's really pretty crazy. Like as a kid, if you're playing sports and working out hard, like you, your body can change and transform, like even if you eat like shit, but especially if, if you fine-tune that it's it's the results are exponential so I was always in that world and then um, in 2005 I actually had some really weird health challenges like out of the blue got really sick um, I was having a ton of joint pain a ton of fatigue losing muscle not sleeping well exhausted during the day and really in hindsight you know I really probably well I, I didn't probably in hindsight I had uh, some severe food sensitivities that were just never diagnosed. And so this is 2005. This is like pre-YouTube, pre-blog, pre-access to this information everywhere. Today, you can Google stuff, you can find blogs, you can find stuff on YouTube, and you can literally like heal yourself or get answers. Back then, you didn't really have that. So I was just like healthy, fit guy who was at the time working right out of college in the business world and just had all these symptoms. I saw 27 different doctors in the course of like about a year and a half, two years, and all of them just kind of had a different bullshit diagnosis. Nobody could really help me. And all the while I was feeling worse and worse and worse. So finally I met this woman who I call like this crazy hippie chick at the time again, you know, no YouTube. So she's from Oregon. She's totally into like health and wellness and, and uh, kind of naturopathic stuff. And it was pretty woo woo back then. Like it was just not as accepted as it is today. And so after seeing all these doctors who couldn't really help me, I was like, well, I got nothing to lose. I might as well try what this woman wants me to do. So I remember it was like on my birthday, 2005, and I'm like buying a probiotic and I'm buying like these gut repair supplements and these adrenal repair supplements. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, am I, is this even worth it? Am I just blowing money on this stuff? And then she's like, what we got to do is you got to like, you know, not eat sugar and get away from dairy and no, don't eat processed grains. And at the time it was like, oh my God, this is insanity. Like how can somebody live without bread? You know, how can somebody live without oatmeal? And so I had nothing to lose. I was in enough pain that I was like willing to make the change. So I went down this road and in about two weeks, it absolutely changed my life. So I was like a believer and I just held on to every word she said, everything she taught me. And as I felt better and better, um, I kind of started to go down this path of this passion for wellness. And so I already knew a lot about athletic performance, about optimization, but I started to learn about gut health, about hormones, about toxicity, about inflammation, about all these things that now we would call like wellness versus, you know, fitness or nutrition. And so I became very well versed in these things from about 2005 to 2008, 2009. And there was a guy who played in the NBA. His name was Kyle Korver, a good, good friend of mine. We went to college together. We used to work out together in the off season. You know, I would, I, at the time, I was doing a lot of MMA training and crazy stuff. And he just liked working out with me. I liked working out with him. We pushed each other, mainly in the weight room or, you know, doing workouts, not playing basketball. And so we, we became great friends. We were actually roommates in college for a year and kept in touch. And so it so happened that fast forward to 2009, um, he was at the end of uh, a contract in the NBA. He had three surgeries in one off season. And I was on my own path to like, you know, this hippie health wellness stuff that at the time, even in 2009, was still a little weird, a little out there. And so I remember, um, you know, we, we connected and he's like, hey, man, I would love your help. My body's destroyed right now. I'm hurt. I'm, I'm, I might be done. You know, he was 29 years old and he's like, I might be done. I just might be done hanging it up and I was like no there's no way you're done like you can you can reverse this you can heal inflammation you can totally transform your body and so he flew me out to Salt Lake City and I was with him for like two weeks I walked in his, his place threw all shit away out of his cabinets got all of his supplements got all of his food ready and we did this regimen every day for two weeks and he started to feel 
like, oh my gosh, my body is, feels better. My recovery is better. My knees don't hurt as much. My tendonitis is going away. And so the combination of what I did, plus at the same time, he's, he, after we started doing that, he started working with a guy who, where he totally changed, worked on his alignment. He had a guy who did body work, which is like deep tissue massage therapy slash probably rolfing. It was this weird combination. So I was one third of the things that he did. And I realized I saw with like, I mean, he was, he be then went on to become an NBA all-star. He then went on, he was, I think this first or second oldest person ever in the NBA to become an all-star that late in his career, which is a huge deal. He, he set a record for the all time, uh, best three point percentage in NBA history. He had an amazing second half of his career. Um, that was about six years in. He ended up playing for, I think, 17 or 18 years. And it was largely because, you know, some of the things I taught him, plus some other things that he did. That gave me the confidence to be like, oh, my gosh, like, this can help people. This is real. So after that happened, he said, hey, I want to hire you. You need to come out to Salt Lake. You need to be with me for the next, you know, six months or year, and we're going to really do this. So he hired me. And this kind of started my business in the nutrition performance coaching world. And I basically then, when I moved to Salt Lake, there's a ton of Olympic athletes there, other professional athletes there. There's a ton of serious CrossFit athletes there. I had the ability to work with the top CrossFit gym in the country at the time um, with Tommy Hackenbrook and some other people at Ute CrossFit. They've, you know, he's been top 10 in the CrossFit games, I think, three times. Personally, his team has won the Affiliate Cup multiple times. So I instantly was around all these great high performers and I was just sharing my knowledge, sharing my knowledge, bringing stuff to them that they hadn't really seen before. And CrossFit at the time, 2009, 10, they were very much into the paleo diet and I was basically an expert on the paleo diet. So I started sharing this. I started doing seminars and teaching people all about this. So then it kind of spurred into a coaching business where I had some high end clients like Kyle, like, you know, certain pro athletes that would fly me out to where they are. They'd pay me to be with them. And then during the day I could do phone consultations with other people around the world or around the, you know, around the country, around the world. And so I grew this coaching business and then, you know, so for, I did that for about 11 years and the last three years of that, I kind of transitioned by default into executive coaching. You know, I call them kind of old rich fat guys, which, which I know isn't, isn't uh, politically correct, but we're not too politically correct around here, so I can say it. Um, but I did a lot, of, a lot of coaching with executive, you know, business owners, executives, entrepreneurs, and that was actually a great market for me because I personally was entrepreneurial. I love business. I love, you know, money and, and business ideas. And so I was really able to kind of speak their language and talk to these guys. So for the last three years in that world, I was, I was you know, coaching those guys. And it spurred into a business deal where I partnered up with three of them and all three of these guys were actually buying off market real estate deals. And previously I had actually had a real estate license. I had a few rentals or my early twenties. I was a huge proponent and very passionate about investment real estate, but the 2008, 2000 market, 2008 and 2009 market kind of crashed. So I ended up selling, you know, my stuff when I started this other business. So fast forward to, you know, 2018, 19. And I had done this venture with these three guys and we had a, we started a business where we taught Filipino virtual assistants how to make off market real estate calls. So they would make cold calls, trying to find great investment deals on real estate, on residential real estate. And so we're doing this and I'm realizing that like, I'm, in, I'm part of this business. We did, we did, we grew the business, we made money. But I'm realizing the clients that we're doing this for are making a ton of money and they're creating wealth and they're acquiring all these properties. And I'm like, why am I, why am I not doing this? This is stupid. I should be doing this. So through a turn of events, 2019, I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And so the company I was involved in with these guys, we all came to agreement. We all kind of went our own ways, sold out, moved on. And then in 2019, like literally this exact time, April of 2019, I get super sick again out of the blue okay so at this time i mean i literally have pictures i can show them right now like was was probably in the best shape of my life you know of my 30s for sure and um wake up one night just drenched in sweat so april 9 2019 wake up drenched in sweat it happens every night for like 10 days in a row 
And during that time, of course, I called my doctor, who I have a functional medicine doctor who I'm close with, Dr. Biscup. And he's like, you know, come in for some tests. Let's see what's going on. You know, maybe you have some type of viral infection or something. So I go in for tests and they do some lab work and they basically can't really find anything, but some of my inflammatory markers are off. So this keeps going on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I'm, t I'm not talking like a little sweaty. I'm talking like drenched in sweat, an outline of my body in the bed have to change the sheets, have to shower like three, four or five times a night. So then that's happening at night. I'm having these night sweats. Then every afternoon I'm starting to get like chills and shakes and fevers. And so I go from being super healthy to like crazy sick to the point where I can't even work because I'm having horrible body pain, horrible fevers, you know, chills, night sweats. I'm not sleeping at night. I'm exhausted during the day. Um, I'm starting to lose weight. So they get me an appointment with an infectious disease doc. Um, so, so then this goes on in April, and there's a lot of other appointments and a lot of stuff that happens, but by June uh, of 2019, I'm in the hospital. So I spent 11 days in the hospital running every test known to man. Um, finally, they find a mass outside my liver. So there's this weird mass outside my liver. They don't know what it is. First, they think it's maybe like an abscess or an infection. I had been in, I had been in Asia the year before traveling. They're like, maybe you got some type of bug or parasite. You're super healthy, so your body fought it, walled it off. So they're going to have to do a biopsy to see what, what it is. So super fun, huge needle through your ribs into your liver to biopsy. The first biopsy comes back completely inconclusive. They have no idea. There's, there's, they can't find anything. So two days later, I do another one. Same thing, completely inconclusive. So now here I am, like 38 years old, in the hospital, um, and I'm basically told, we think you have a rare cancer. So I'm sitting there. You know, literally a month before, I have pictures of me in Florida on the beach, living it up, like feeling great. And now I'm laying in a hospital bed at 38 years old thinking, holy shit, this is it. And um, we go back and forth, test after test after test. They can't figure anything out. But it, for there was a period of time where they thought for sure it was a rare cancer. Maybe it started in my gallbladder. Maybe it started somewhere else. So they're doing scans and biopsies and lab work, and they just can't figure it out. So finally, after 11 days in the hospital, I lose like over 20 pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm eating hospital food. I'm not sleeping. They, they're shit beeping everywhere. They wake you up multiple times. They wake you up at 4 a.m. to fucking weigh you. It's like, I'm sick. I'm I feel like I'm dying in the hospital. Do you really need to weigh me at 4 a.m.? And then I fall back asleep and at 5 a.m. they come and do blood work. You know, it's like the most unhealthy environment ever. So finally I tell the doctors like, you have no idea what's up going on. If I'm not dying, Really, I'm probably gonna die from being in this fucking place, so let me out. So they're fun, like, fine, they let me out after 11 days, and then um, I'm not better. And so then I go to the Mayo Clinic, they're not sure, they wanna do biopsies, they wanna do more scans, they wanna do more tests, nobody knows. So they come to the conclusion that maybe it's an infection, even though we can't find an infection, even though three biopsies sh don't show anything. And so let's put you on IV antibiotics for 30 days and see what happens. Now, mind you, in the hospital, I'd already been on four different IV antibiotics to make sure they were killing it if it was an infection. So I come back from the Mayo Clinic to UNMC in Omaha, and every single day for 30 days, I go into basically like a chemotherapy type place where people are hooked up to chemotherapy, but I'm hooked up to antibiotics every day for about an hour and a half is the, is the drip, um, and the thing grows. I still feel like shit, I don't feel better, and the thing actually grows. So then they send me back to the, the doctor who originally saw it, and he's like, okay, we need to cut this thing out like immediately because it's bigger. But the bad news is I can't do it because it has now grown too big and I can't do it. It's, it's all around your liver. So they send me to a liver transplant doctor who says I can do it, but we're doing it like tomorrow. And I'm just like, holy shit, we're doing it tomorrow. And, and so... It was just this crazy thing. It lasted from April 9th. The surgery was on September 24th. So for six months, I was sicker and shit, just going from appointment to appointment, not working. And right before you, mind you, this is when I decided I'm going to get into this real estate thing. I'm going to do it. So for six months, I was just, you know, not really doing anything. I was just trying to live. And long story longer, the 24th, I do the surgery. It's a nine hour surgery. They take out 40% of my liver plus the mass sew me back up. I'm in the ICU for four days. The second day, 
Um, it was a, it was a crazy story, but the second day I wake up and I'm not feeling well and I, I know something's wrong. And, uh, at the time I was dating a girl who was a nurse and she happened to be there. She spent the night at the hospital. She was there. And so it was like six, 7 AM in the morning. And she was the one that was pressing them. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Like this isn't right. And so I could see, she was pretty calm. I could see her concern. So then that kind of freaked me out. So long story short, again, I had internal bleeding. So internal bleeding, they said, oh my God, you have internal bleeding. They're, they're basically grabbing my bed. I can see the ceiling tiles, you know, they're, they're wheeling me from the ICU. Hey, we're taking you back into emergency surgery, blah, blah, blah. I remember just getting dropped on the table, just ugh. And then the anesthesiologist is right there. The anesthesiologist was actually walking with me as we're wheeling and he's throwing stuff in me. And um, so after internal bleeding, you know, have that other surgery, it's a great time in the ICU for a few more days. Then I get C. diff. C. diff is like a horrible gut infection. So it was just like, I mean, talk about rock bottom. So I go through this, not working, lose, I think at the end, all in all, I lost about 40 pounds of muscle, which is skin and bones. I mean, it was, I'll, I'll show pictures, I'll share with you guys what it, what it was. And um, then go through a horrible breakup. So like within two weeks of that, right? So, I mean, it was just 2019 was like rock bottom, you know, as far as I wake up and I'm like, I don't, what's next? You know, like I th want to do this real estate thing. I'm not working. I late relationships over. I'm financially not in a good place. Um, what's next, you know? And, and so I woke up and it was like, first thing I got to do is I got to get back in shape. I got to, you know, get healthy. So I focused on that. And then by March, it was, it was probably, yeah, February, March of 2020. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go all in. And so I decided to go all in. I decided I'm going to hire some callers. I'm going to find some off-market real estate deals. And I'm going to do this thing. And my goal at the time was maybe if I could get 100 properties over the next five years, that would be amazing. And so I went from one to 120 months, one to 185 in 32 months. And, you know, the pain, the, the desperation, the, the shit that I went through really gave me the motivation to just go all in and to make shit happen. And so here we are, you know? And so my whole goal now I think is to just share with people like the knowledge that I have, the things that I've learned, if I can save people time, if I can give people shortcuts, um, I wanna do that. And then I think one of my biggest passions now is just building my team, you know, building our, our team, you know, to um, do more and to scale and to do great things, so. So I think there's this theory of follow your passion, you know, as long as you follow your passion and do what you love, you're never going to work a day in your life. And I think I went down that road for a while, like in the health, wellness, nutrition business. But honestly, now I, I actually think it's bad advice. I think um, what people should really do is they should take a step back and they should ask themselves, do I love fitness? Okay, the, the business of fitness is different than loving fitness. The business of interior design is different. Like loving to make your home look beautiful is way different than the business of interior design. The business of investing or day trading is different than loving to invest and manage your money. Because the difference is, is like you have to deal with people's emotions. You have to deal with pain in the ass people, right? And so it's so different. So I think if I could go back and give myself advice before I was starting my business and following my passion. Now, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't change what I did for 10, 11 years. I met some amazing people, tons of pro athletes, got to travel, got to do some really cool stuff, you know, th through just working with Kyle Korver, got to freaking, you know, go to Michael Jordan's private party, got to do, you know, got to do cool stuff, right? Like golf at amazing courses, travel, blah, blah, blah. Go to hundreds of NBA games, right? Meet players, do, do cool stuff. But I'll tell you this, if I could go back, the advice that I would give to somebody who's like looking at starting a business or looking to get into something is figure out the intersection of what you're good at, like, like, or what you're best at, what you can stand or what you like enough and what you can make the most money at. Okay. So there's like, it's like intersection. There's a sweet spot of like, what can I make the most money at? But I like it enough. I can stand doing it and I'm pretty damn good at it. What is that thing? Because that thing might allow you to make a great living and create financial freedom or, or time freedom or location freedom where the thing that you're passionate about might be a freaking nightmare, right? Because I think people should find that thing. And then if that thing allows them to work 30 or 40 or 50 hours a week and make more money or have more freedom, 
then they can stop after the period of time they work each week and they can go do the thing that they love in the first place. Because what happens is people say, I love working out, I wanna be a trainer, and then they start to fucking hate the gym because they're like, this is a nightmare, right? You know, I, I, a, a good friend of mine is a, a, a designer and her house is immaculate, it's amazing, it's beautiful, right? And so she had this idea to start this design company and she's done well and I've helped give her advice on it. But it's way different chasing people for money invoicing people, arguing with people, managing contractors. It's way different doing the business than it is making your home look beautiful. And so I think everybody needs to take a step back and they need to find that intersection of what they're good at, what they can stand, and what they can make the most money at. So I would tell everybody that you're actually in two businesses. Most people think like I'm in the business of real estate or I'm in the business of financial planning or I'm a personal trainer. In reality, you're actually in two businesses. You're in the business you think you're in and then you're in the business of acquiring clients. And so, so many people think that I'm super smart with money. I got all these qualifications. I'm amazing or I'm the same thing in the you know fitness space. Like I'm super knowledgeable. I'm jacked. I'm this, I'm that. Well, great. But all that matters is how many clients you can get. So again, there's like this intersection of like knowing enough and being good enough, but also having the skills to acquire clients. So, you know, most people don't realize that the, per the financial guy who makes the most money, the personal trainer who makes the most money, any business that makes the most money, they're good enough at what they do, but they're really damn good at acquiring clients. And that is probably the number one skill of business is the person who can acquire clients, whether that be through sales, whether that be through marketing or attraction or whatever, the person who can acquire the most client, <laughs> the person who can acquire the most clients wins, period, in business. That's, that's what it's about. You know, it's funny. I think there's no such thing as passive income. Like we all have this pipe dream of like <laughs> passive income. Like, oh my God, I mean, shit, I own... Now, you know, we've got up to 185 doors. We're down, you know, sold some down to like 174. And it's surely not passive. Let me tell you, <laughs> it is not passive. Um, and, if it, and if it is, you, have, you give up a ton of your profit to a management company. And even then, it's not passive because you have to manage the management company. So here's the deal. I would say the biggest reason why real estate is powerful, and I, in my opinion, a better investment than many other investments, is because of the leverage, Okay. So most investments, let's just say you take, you have $20,000 and you put it in the market or you put it in some sort of, you know, crypto or a stock market, whatever it may be, your return is on that 20,000. So if you make 10% on that 20,000, you're making a $2,000 profit, which is great. 10% is, is, is pretty good. Now, obviously in the crypto world and some worlds, people are wanting like crazy returns, but the point is your return is based on your investment. Real estate is different because you, you have the component of leverage. So the power of leverage is that with $20,000, for example, I can buy $100,000 of real estate. It might be a little bit less now, but at one point, 20% down was kind of the standard, right? So a 20% down payment of 20,000 buys me a $100,000 property. Now, the crazy thing is my investment, the $100,000 property, that's what I'm getting return on, okay? So I'm getting the appreciation of that asset every year. So if that asset just goes up 5%, now it's worth 105,000. So my 20,000 made a $5,000 return on the appreciation, but then we also have the cash flow. So the difference between, you know, what a person uh their expenses are on a monthly basis and then the rent that comes in, that's the positive cash flow. And on a hundred thousand dollar house, you know, for us, you know, our, our average price point is more like 140, but our average cash flow is about 380 per door. So, you know, just doing the math, you know, you might have cash flow of like, you know, three, call it uh, three grand a year, roughly, uh, you know, 2,500 to three grand a year. Well, on your $20,000 cash investment, you're getting the appreciation, which was 5,000 a year go, and more and more over time. And then you're also getting the cash flow, which might be 2,500 to three grand a year. So if you just compare those things, the cash on cash return, the appreciation to a standard investment, it's gonna be better in most cases. Now, a stock market or a market-based investment is probably gonna be passive. So real estate's not passive, so that's the downside. Now, if we elaborate on this a little bit further, 
the beauty of real estate is you also have tax advantages. So if you look at like all the pieces of real estate, you have the appreciation of the asset, it goes up, you have debt pay down. So the, the tenant is paying the monthly expenses and that debt is going down, the assets going up, the debt is going down. Um, that's creating your equity. Then on top of that, uh, I talked about the cash flow. And then on top of that, you have tax advantages, the biggest one being depreciation. So depreciation is a pretty powerful thing because it's basically just, I'm going to dumb this down and this isn't perfect for, you know, high level people out there, but just for a person who doesn't understand it, let's just say you have this $100,000 uh, property and in residential real estate, you, the depreciation is usually 27 and a half years. So what they do, the IRS has a rule that says, we'll take the value of that, divide it by 27 and a half. Now there's certain things that have a faster depreciation, maybe like appliances or certain fixtures or things in the, in the, in the real estate. So to simplify this model, let's just say you get to depreciate that $100,000 asset over 25 years. So that means that if you take 100,000 divided by 25, that's 4,000. So you would get a tax deduction of $4,000 every year for the next 25 years. If you have 100 properties, that's a $400,000 a year tax deduction, okay? So it's an amazing thing and it offers a lot of powerful investment tools that you don't have in the market or in other types of investments, but it's not passive. So you got to weigh your options. And so for me, you know, I love the fact that you have all those things with the appreciation, the depreciation, the debt pay down and the positive cash flow. So when we look at the Burr model, for those people at home, that's B plus four R's. So that was a term or a phrase coined by the guys at Bigger Pockets, the biggest you know real estate investment podcast platform in the world. I think Brandon Turner officially was the guy that that created that, and it stands for buy, rehab, uh, rent, refinance, repeat. So it's just the model, right? And another thing about real estate that makes it so powerful is you can have the ability to sort of like manipulate it or change it or control it. Whereas like other stuff in the market or other types of investments, you have like no control. Like if I invest money in the stock market, I have almost no control on that unless I'm like the CEO or on the board of directors of a company, you know, and there's legalities around that, but you really have very little control. Whereas for me, even a smaller, you know, mom and pop type investor, how I started, I have a ton of control. So I can go find a dilapidated house that most people are scared of because there's a sewer issue or there's was a flood or there was a fire or something. And I can say, Hey, I'll take that on. That's a mess, but I'll take that on because I know if I buy it for 50 or 60,000, I know at the end of the day, it's worth 140. So people think that like real estate investing is, can be, and it can be risky. But people have huge misconceptions about Burr. So if I'm buying a property to Burr, I'm buying it at a huge discount. I, I know I'm only buying this if it's at a big discount. And I know that my money that I'm willing to put in there, if I, if I look at the purchase price plus the rehab price, it has to be less than 80% of the entire value. And when we were in our prime last year, bought 100 properties, um, actually 99, I don't want to exaggerate, but we say hundred because we were one short and it really, really pissed me off. Cause we were, our goal was hundred. We ended up at 99. So I don't mean to exaggerate cause it was only 99. But when we did that in 2022, we were oftentimes at 60 to 70% of, so the, the purchase price plus the amount of money we had to rehab, we were only at 60%, 60 to 70% of the value. So that means we're creating a ton of equity, right? Now what happens, and this is where you come up with what's called a cash out refi. So for people who aren't familiar with this, a cash out refi means that you actually get money back. You get more money back from the bank than you even put into the property. Okay. So let's just do like a simple math example. Okay. Let's say I bought a property for 40,000 and I put 22,000 in it. So 40,000 plus 22 is 62,000 of my cash or of my line of credit or of if I borrowed hard money, whatever it may be, but somehow I had cash to pay 40 plus 22. Maybe you did some of the, some of the work, or maybe you have a team around you so you can do the work cheaper, right? So I'm in this property for 62,000. I now go to the bank and they say, well, great, we're going to do a, an appraisal and we'll give you 80% of the value. 
So they do their appraisal, it comes in at 100,000, they'll say, we'll give you 80% of that. So they're gonna give me a mortgage, they're gonna give me a check for 80,000. I only put 62,000 in, they give me 80, the spread of what they gave me versus what I had in, I made $18,000. That's called a cash out refi. And that $18,000, as long as you use it correctly, is not taxable. So it's an amazing thing. So when you look at the Burr model and you look at the power of doing a cash out refi, it's an amazing model. So when I look at my properties, all you know, hundred and close to 180 doors, if I look at like how much money I have tied up, some of them I have money tied up, a lot of them I got money back, but all in all, net, net, I got money back. So I have all these properties with zero of my money in. So my return on investment, if I look at these Burr transactions and these cash out refis, it's infinite because zero of my money is tied up in the deal. And so my returns are infinite where there's no other investment in the world I could do that's like that. All right, Terry, just looking at one of your portfolios and understanding what you're primarily invested in, you have mostly single family residence versus yeah. multifamily. Why is that? Yeah, everything I own is four units or less. And I would say 90% is single family. We have a couple of, you know, we have some duplexes and a, a couple three unit and one four unit. So here's the deal. This is a great question. I get this question all the time. And you know, you've got people like Grant Cardone and a lot of like famous guys on, on the internet right now who are who are selling multifamily investing. Well, most multifamily big time investors, what they do is they raise money. So they raise capital and they might be a syndication or it might be some type of like limited partnership or there, there's different ways to do it, but it's generally not all their money, right? So the reason I've gone down the path of single family is because it's, it's my money. I control it. I don't have to, I have, I have a couple partners on some of the portfolios, but I mean, 90, you know, probably 75 to 80% of my portfolio is all me. So I don't have to answer to anyone. So that's the number one reason. Number two is there's just less competition. So in the apartment world, in the multifamily, like especially when you get 20, 50 units and up, there's a crazy amount of competition. So you've got these big funds like Cardone Capital and these other big hedge funds from around the world who are buying apartments and they're paying a lot of money. So their cash on cash return is nowhere near as good as mine. But I'm trying to place hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars where they're trying to place tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So they're willing to take a lower return on their investment because they can scale. And so if you look at it, it's just a couple reasons. One, there's too much competition in multifamily. The returns aren't as good, but you can scale huge. So you got to take that into consideration with my model, less competition. I can control it more. And most people aren't willing to scale. I, I, I don't know if I've ever met anyone else that owns as many single family houses as I do, because most guys get to 20 or 50 or 100 and then they move to, you know, apartments. Um, it's very rare that I ever meet anybody that has as many single family houses as I do, but we have the model, it's working, so I'm not gonna change it. And my returns, my cash on cash returns, my cash flow per door, all the things that I care about are much greater in my portfolio than they are in some of these big portfolios, but I'll never be able to scale this to thousands and thousands of units the way that they can. So when you talk about scaling, mm -hmm. I know 180 something doors is not your final resting place. Do you have a yeah. target number in mind? Well, it might be my final resting place if it kills me, but <laughs> <laughs> speaking of final resting places. Um, so, you know, I think in 2022, when we were just rolling and we got, you know, we, we acquired 99 doors in one year, we were one short of a hundred. Um, I thought, oh, this is going to, we're going to get to 500. We're going to get to 300. You know, you know, like you had this, we had this vision of like where we're going to go, but you, you know, I've seen a down market. So I know what can happen right now. We're in a weird market where interest rates are high, but the prices aren't coming down. It's just a weird volatile market where nobody's quite sure what's going to happen. I think prices have to come down, especially as like inflation's out of control and interest rates are going up. So our biggest thing right now, and this is, you know, why you're, you've come onto our team is to really fine tune our processes and systems and start working smarter, not harder. And we want to like stabilize and optimize the portfolio we have. And then hopefully when the prices come down, we're going to be in a great position to buy. So 
if we can get things in order as far as our systems, our processes, and our overall operations, which we will, you know, um, then I, I would love to see in the next two to three years if we can get to, to the three to 500 range. And I really think we can because we have the right people, we have the right team. And a big part of that is I took construction in-house. So we manage construction. It's a nightmare, but it allows us to go way faster. It allows us to go way faster than the average person can. And so that's how we're able to acquire and keep 100 properties in a year, whereas most people can't fathom that. You know, and a lot of it's just just having having the right team. So long story longer, it all depends on the market. But I could absolutely see us going, you know, trying to hit that 500 market. And, and then here's the deal. Like I see what do I see in the end? I mean, people always say like, oh, just own real estate forever, and never sell it. And that might make sense. Right. Like we might just put operations in place to manage it. And then like we all step back and we do other ventures. But I think there's going to be a huge opportunity when I talked about that institutional money and I talked about those, the big, big money going after the apartments, I think there's going to be a huge opportunity to sell to some foreign investors or foreign hedge fund, 500 single family houses, because 500 single family houses, it's a nightmare to manage, but it's way more stable than one, you know, 20 million or $50 million apartment building. So I think the, the goal would be eventually to sell to a hedge fund or foreign investors and have an, have an agreement with them to manage it for a certain amount of time. What are your thoughts about commercial real estate investing? I know a little bit about commercial. And again, it's all about scale. It's all about how much money do you have to place? If you, if you have tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars that you have to place, like meaning your fund has that money that has to get to work for you, you've got to go commercial. You've got to go multifamily. But um, if you're working with millions or tens of millions and you have the systems and processes for, for, um, residential, I, I like it better. Commercial scares the shit out of me. I mean, look at, co <laughs> look, look at, look at COVID, you know, like people fucking don't need a, don't need offices anymore. You know, retail, Amazon killed a bunch of retail. So COVID really did a number on offices and retail. I think there's probably always going to be a need for industrial type space. Um, so I think I'm very much open to commercial. Um, I'm very much open to apartments, but I think, that the time will come for that when we've scaled to the point where we don't think we can keep scaling in our current model. And so I think one of the best things that I've done, if I look back at the last three years, and this is funny because, you know, again, you're coming on at like a really transitional time, but probably the best thing that I did and Je Jesse on our team always would fight me on this. And, and, and he would laugh because, you know, in the end he knew, he knew my point and he agreed with me, but I would say no to everything. Like, no, like focus, no, focus, no, focus. There, there's a famous interview with Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and somebody else, three billionaires, and they, they asked them a question, like if, if there was one trait or one thing that you could share with everybody that led you be, to become so successful and a billionaire, what would it be? And Bill Gates and Warren Buffett at the same time said focus and the ability to say no. So it's so important that if you have something that works, keep doing it keep doing it, make it better, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. So I think people go wrong. People lose their ass when they do great in one thing and then they buy a fucking hotel or they buy a restaurant or they buy a gym or they do something that's totally outside of their core competency and they realize this is a very operational thing and they lose. And, and then they're like, damn, I should have just kept doing it. It's boring. It sucks to keep going down this way, but focus and saying no is so key. Do you think deprivation plays part of that? hundred percent priving yourself of hundred percent. It's so hard. I, I get bored all the time. So if you look at our business, we have acquisition side, that's what acquired the properties. Then we had to put property management in place to manage them. And then we said, dang, we want to go faster. So we started construction and then we're like, well, we want construction. We want to hire more guys. So let's do construction for other people. So then we started doing construction for other investors, right? So now there's four businesses to manage instead of just one or two. And then it turned into five because my two best guys, they spent a bunch of time running uh, roofing companies in the past. We saw the opportunity say, well, between my 180 doors and our, the investors that we do construction for, there's 500 roofs. We should start a roofing company. And so we decided to do that 
and I kind of cannibalized my other businesses because I took two of my top performers, two of my leaders, and I freaking let them start another business with me. I'm an owner of it, but it really screwed my other businesses. And so in hindsight, I'm like, man, we did it because of the market. We did it because of the opportunity. So there was a reason behind it. But if we were still in the same market as we were in 22, we would have never done it because you, it's, it's all about focusing. And so as far as deprivation and as far as boredom, it's just boredom. Like, like people, people want the bigger, better, the grass is greener, it's just like in relationships or just like with anything in life, you know, like the grass is not always greener. And so sometimes you need to just, instead of like, like if you're crushing it in an area, why, why would you go start something new that you're not even competent in, right? Like it would be way easier for you and I to work together to double my existing business than go start a new business. And even some of the conversations we've had, I think about later, like, oh, that was stupid. Like, like I have something great here. Like I have something here that very few people have done, acquire a hundred properties and keep them in a year. And we have this huge portfolio. It's a small amount of ownership. It's, it's all in house. Doubling that would be 10 times better than starting some other business, you know? And so it's, so sometimes you just have to keep your eye on the ball, say no to shit and just keep going. How do you flux between each of these organizations or determine who's going to get your time or how that time is going to be spent or managed? <laughs> That's a million dollar question. I mean, it's so hard. It's so hard. And, 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 and that's why, like, I have to find leaders. I have to find people that are, that are, I, 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 I say the word and I, sh again, not politically correct and I shouldn't say it, but I say, I look for like killers, like, you know, and you're former military. So like, I have to be careful what I say, <laughs> but I mean, for real, like there's people that are just killers, like, like meaning like, you know, again, I don't want everybody to take everything like literally the, w the way that I say it, but I'm, I'm just saying like, there's people like if you had to go to war or you had to be in a tough situation, you want them on your team, right? And then there's people that like, you don't really know if you can trust, you don't really know if they're gonna do what they say. And those people are under, we have to have some of those people on our team, but I'm always looking for like, who's, who's like a killer, you know? And like talking to you, interviewing you, the first two minutes of our conversation on Zoom, I'm like, okay, this person gets it, they're different, right? And so me, it's finding as many leaders as I can and finding as many people that I believe in as I can. And there's this saying that I've, I think I've heard Gary Keller say it, who is, you know, the president or founder of Keller Williams. And he says, you know, m make, give people the opportunity to make their world so big within yours that they don't want to leave. Right. So it's like, if I see Shannon or I have Jesse or I have Katie, or I have these people on my team, how can I give them an opportunity on our team that's bigger and greater than they could have elsewhere? Right. Is it ownership? Is it rev share? Is it, is it, is it uh, performance based? Like, what does it look like? Right. And so that's kind of what I've had to do, but yes, I'm definitely spread thin now, like trying to do all these things. And so the answer is like, I have to develop, find and develop leaders and then trust them and let them run with it. But I'm at a weird place right now where I'm definitely spread too thin and I'm trying to do too many things. Um, even just the, the stuff we have, I mean, I'm, I'm super behind on. So, I mean, I don't know that I really answered that question, but you might find something in there. No, I think you talk a lot about protecting time, saying no. Mm -hmm. That's a huge thing that mm -hmm. continues to propel you forward. You also talk about meetings are a waste of so much time. Oh, my God. I love this. Yeah. I mean, I don't always, I don't always live this to the T, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have you on board because we're going to fix this. But you know, people in corporate America and just in general, they want to meet, you know, like people uh, like when I was building this thing and I was like going all in, people would always say, Oh, I want to pick your brain. Oh, I want to have coffee. Oh, I want to have lunch. And I'm like, fuck, no, I don't have time for that shit. You know, like, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. You know? And so even, even our, my team would be like, Oh, we should meet. We should meet. It's like, okay, listen, like if we meet, that means I have to stop what I'm doing, get ready to leave. I have to drive to the place. I have to wait for everybody to get there. We waste time doing all this stuff. Then I have to do the meeting, which probably wasn't even necessary in the first place. And then I have to leave and drive back. And then when I get back, I have to get back in the headspace of where I was before and I started working. 
And pretty soon a 45 minute meeting wasted an hour and a half to two hours. Like literally wasted the production of an hour and a half and two hours. Now I could be on the phone while I'm driving. I could be shooting a texture there. I could be listening to a podcast or whatever. Like there could be some productivity ish type stuff, but like when you're in your deep work, like whether whatever it is, the most important thing, like you're running financials on a purchase, you're, you're creating a system or process for the business, you're whatever it may be, you're making big decisions. Like you need to be in that headspace. And it's not just the time of the meeting. It's the time you waste stopping what you're doing, going to the meeting and then getting back in that headspace. And then sometimes like my best, my best, most clear thoughts, like from the first three hours of the day, I can get way more done in that time than I can any time throughout the day. And so if I'm bombarded with bullshit during that time, like my productivity is absolutely crushed, you know? So I think it's about setting weekly meetings, having agendas for those meetings and making sure that like you're using your time wisely, which I'll tell you right now, I need to, I need to personally, I need to take my own advice because we're, we're, we're in a weird transition where we got to clean some of that up. Agreed. Yeah. They say for every distraction that you have the amount of time that that took to handle that distraction. And then you have to add on eight minutes to get back to where you were. So if you do yeah. that, it's crazy. And when I get bills from our CPA and attorneys, I'm just like, Oh bullshit. You know, like how much, they, you know, cause they're billing you for time. And I'm like, right. man, like, so I think like my, my kind of my slogan, my thought process now, just with, with, as I like design my life, optimize my life, you know, I, I say healthy, wealthy, free. Right. And so, there's this theory of like so many people at different points in their life, they are all about one of those things, right? Like they're all about like, okay, I have money. Now I'm going to invest it into my body. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to get in shape. Right. Or maybe they're young and they have no money, but they just want significance. And so they want to put on some muscle. They want to look great. Um, many people sacrifice everything to create money. Um, and there's very few people that are actually free, you know? So there's tons of people that, you know, maybe they're, they're a trainer and they look great and they're in the, but they're stuck to the gym 12 hours a day. They, they cannot leave. They have no location freedom. They have no time freedom because they're stuck in the gym, but they look like a Greek God. And then you've got the guy who's the CEO of a fortune 500 company worth millions worse than stuck. I mean, he's trapped. Like he, 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 his, his stress levels, like he is trapped in that deal, right? He can't quit. He can't do anything else because there's nothing he could do to make more money. So he's wealthy but he's not healthy. He's not free. And then there's people who are just like a crazy hippie driving around in a van who are free <laughs> as shit. Right. And they might be sort of healthy. They probably don't have any money, but it's like finding the intersection of those three things, right? Like where is this optimal intersection of those three things where you have enough of all of them to be happy. And I think different people are driven by different things. I mean, there was definitely a time in my life where I just wanted to be healthy because I was like facing death. And so I gave up, I would give up anything just to be healthy. And then there's times when I've probably not been healthy from the standpoint of stress or balance and I've gone all in on my business, you know, especially the last three years, um, three to four years where I've sacrificed a lot. I've probably worked too hard. I've not had enough sleep at times. I've had too much stress at times, not enough balance, but I achieved, you know, financial freedom. And so I'm just super fascinated by where is the intersection for people, healthy, wealthy, free. And I think that's one of my missions is just, as I try to find that for myself, you know, giving people advice on, you know, where that, where that point is in their life and where they can, how they can create that personally. How do you give advice to people who don't identify wealth as a monetary value? Yeah you know, and, and that's, 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 I think why that's, that's a great question. And I think wealth could mean anything to you. Right. Um, and that's why I say healthy, wealthy, free, because, because somebody might just want to be healthy and free. Sweet. So, so your point on the intersection is different than mine, yeah. but, but it's, it's, it's like, I want to be healthy and I want freedom. Perfect. Then, then, then that's going to, that's going to be what's, gives you happiness. And so I think, of course, there's more to it. Like you could look at relationships, you could look at spirituality, you could look at all these different things that are important in life. But I think it's really important for people to get very intentional and know where I'm trying to go. Because I think too many people have no idea where they're going and they get stuck, right? So again, you know, it's, it's, it's like giving up 
going all in on one and ruining the other two, mainly with money. Like people do anything they can to create wealth. Their health goes to shit. They have no freedom. And it's like, why did I do this? Right. And, and, and vice versa. So I just think it's, it's about achieving happy, happiness, creating the optimal life for you and knowing where your point is that's, that you think is going to make you happy. Because a lot of people, as humans, like, I don't think we actually know what the hell is going to make us happy. <laughs> and so like, we're, we're going down this path and we're like, oh shit, it's not it. I, there's tons of people that I've consulted with or worked with where they thought business or money or the significance was going to make them happy, and then they got it, and they're like, "Holy shit, I'm I'm more I'm less happy. I'm miserable, right? Because they sacrificed too much to get there." And so I think it's just figuring that out, you know. Yeah. I think understanding that happiness is not a destination; it's right. the journey. Right. So talking a lot about your health, wealth, and freedom. I know one of your crux points was making a decision whether to stay in California or move back to Omaha. <laughs> so this is a crazy point in my life like this was a defining moment in my life right I think back so I was I was towards the end of my coaching business that like I said I was doing a lot of work with with entrepreneurial executive business guys so I was working with a wealthy business owner in California living in Coronado Island it was beautiful it was amazing um and I, at the time I was also involved in the calling business and so I had like multiple streams of income like I was in a really good place like was not in a relationship was was working a lot but was, was pretty happy and, and, and had achieved a lot. And there was a part of me that knew the whole time, like from 2015 ish, all the way to, to 2019, I knew like real estate is the answer. Like I should be investing in real estate. I was seeing these guys acquire these off market deals and do this stuff. And so it was kind of eating at me. It was like, you know what you should be doing, but you're not doing it. But I had other streams of income. I was happy living the good life on Coronado Island. So I came to the conclusion, you know what? I'm just going to enjoy the next year. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, building this company, having coaching clients, and I'm going to enjoy the next year. So I looked at all these places, downtown San Diego, other places, there's Little Italy, there's, you know, some, there's this new development that was like kind of between the two. Sweet building, beautiful pool, infinity edge, fire pit, you know, awesome gym. I could see the ocean from my balcony. Literally had the lease and, and like looked over it, picked out everything. Um, and, and I had an appointment on like a Wednesday to like two o'clock to go sign the lease. Right. So I was literally on my way to go sign the lease. And I just had this weird feeling like, I don't know if I should do this. Oh, fuck. I don't know if I should do this. So I call him and say, Hey, something came up. I'm going to have to come tomorrow. No, no, no worries. Okay. So that, at that night it was just like eating at me. It was like, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should do this, but oh, come on. It's just one year, you know, like, oh, what's 3,200 a month for a one bedroom apartment. You know, I mean, it was just like this, this, this inner battle. And it was like, I can go live in this beautiful place, enjoy it for a year, or I can pick up my shit, go back to Nebraska and I can start buying real estate and building what I know I should be doing for the long run. And it was just this battle. It was just this battle. So literally the next day, I packed up my freaking car and I left. I didn't even tell people. I didn't even tell the people around me, like, I'm leaving, leaving. And I remember I left at, like, 4 o'clock. Like, I packed up all my shit. I left at 4 o'clock, just stopped in Vegas. And I remember, like, texting people, like, hey, I'm – and I didn't – it was just, like, really weird. Like, I didn't even, like, tell people I'm gone, gone. I'm like, oh, hey, I'm gotta, I got to go back to Omaha for a bit. And so I made this decision – like, I have to sacrifice. I have to do this now. And I literally drove back to Omaha. And then I got sick. But the point is, is, like, I made that decision. It was, like, there was two paths. It's, like, I can have fun. I can enjoy life. Or I can go down this path, which is going to create my future. And, like, thank God I did it because it was the best decision I ever made. No regrets? No. I mean, no. I mean, part of me is like, oh, maybe you should have just been there for like three or four months, you know, and then come back. But I mean, there's, there's no regrets. There's no regrets. I mean, I did what I had to do and, um, yeah, no regrets. All right. So you packed up one night and you came back from California. You told nobody nothing stopping along the way in Las Vegas only to come back. Is this where you started to live like you were poor? Yeah. I mean, th this was part of it. I mean, I think I, I, 
I went through periods of time where, you know, lived in nice houses and had nice stuff and acquired things. And then I was kind of like interested in this like minimalistic life and minimalism. And, you know, when I actually moved out to California and worked with the client I was there with, um, I actually sold a ton of stuff. Um, it was just a very transitional time in my life. And I sold a ton of stuff. I literally went out there with what I had in a car. I had a tiny storage. Well, actually, I don't even think I had a storage unit. I, I like put some stuff in my parents' basement when I left. I'm like, hey, this is cheaper than the storage unit. I'm throwing this shit here. And I literally, all I had was in my car. It was so freeing. It was like amazing. Like, oh my God, like all my shit, all this stuff I don't need is just like gone. It was amazing. So I really, I really love that minimalistic feel. But there's been other times in my life. And when I built this business, I, I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't know that I actually learned it somewhere, but since then I've actually heard a couple other people talk about it, but it was like this deprivation, this like when I, I, I moved into this house, I literally had no idea how long I was going to be there. It's where I live now. You've seen it super simple, super plain. But like when I first moved in, like I didn't have furniture. <laughs> I had like some gym equipment in the basement, <laughs> a bed, a table, and that's it. Like for months, and my mom and sister would have, or family would eventually come over like, what is wrong with you? Like, you live like you're homeless. You live like you're poor. Like, what is wrong with you? But it was like, it was like this mindset of ultimate focus. Don't get distracted with stupid shit. Don't buy stuff to like fill voids and to like do whatever. And just live like you're poor. Live, live like you have nothing and just focus on this one thing. And it was an amazing mindset for me. And it helped me scale and it helped me just simplicity, right? It helped me go way faster than I probably could have ever gone. There's a guy that I've, I've heard talk about this as well. His name's Gordon Ryan. He's the arguably the best jujitsu guy in, in the world. And he has this little like process where he has a couple really nice cars, like really expensive cars. He keeps them in the garage and he has like this little like Toyota or something super simple. And during the week, he can only drive the Toyota. Like he keeps it parked outside because it keeps him hungry. It keeps him wanting more. It keeps him grounded. It just keeps him like not, not in anything flashy. And so I don't know. I just think there's something about that. Like I think there's too many people who, as soon as they make a little money, they buy stupid shit or, you know, they, they fill f or are trying to fill a void or, or buy things they never had, which I understand because there's, there's also a point, of, a part of me that's like, sometimes I need to like enjoy life a little bit more and have a little bit more fun and just like let loose. But there's, there's a, I don't know, there's a sweet spot in there about awareness. And I think anybody who has like a crazy goal, whether it be with your body or your business or whatever, I think creating simplicity and like simplifying your life can really help. One thing that everybody <laughs> talks about is college, right? Everybody's <laughs> got to go to college. You got to get a degree. No more vocational schools. Somebody goes to tech. We don't do trade anymore. Yeah. Do you think college helped you? I think this is going to be controversial and I have family members who are pr teachers and college. So I, I apologize right now. I have interns right now who are in business school who are going to watch this, who work with us. So I'm going to apologize to everybody. Don't take it personal. I think college is the biggest fucking scam in the world. If you want to do business, if you're an entrepreneur, if you want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a professor, go to college, right? If your goal is business, if you want to be an entrepreneur, college is a complete waste of money. What did I learn from college? I, I met great people. I met great people, right? Like, like I created great relationships and met great people. But let's think about this, all right? You spend a hundred freaking thousand dollars. That, that's, it's actually way more than that now. Like, you know, a lot of private schools are 40, 50, 60 grand a year, right? So you're looking more like $250,000 you're going to spend on a four-year degree. Even state schools are like, probably you're probably going to spend 80, 60, 80 grand, right? At some, at some places. So you're giving up four years of your life. So the opportunity cost, meaning like the things you could be learning, the things you could be doing during those four years, you could have exponential growth and actual real skills, right? So you're missing the opportunity cost and then you're going into debt, call it a hundred grand. That's non-forgivable money usually it's a higher interest rate i don't even know what student loans are now but um you know i know people who went to medical school dental school whose loans are stuck at like six to eight percent and they're, they're larger than a freaking house payment right so i just think it's a huge scam like if it, you're, you're learning from people who've never made money they're talking about talking about business it's like they're not 
fucking successful entrepreneurs generally. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some that are. But most of my college professors had never made money, had never run a business, never done shit. And I'm paying them $100,000 to learn from them? I mean, it's a scam. It's a complete scam. Like, if you want to be an entrepreneur, get a loan to just pay for your living for a year and go to find an entrepreneur and say, hey, I will work for you. I'll be your intern for free. You're going to learn 10 times more from that person than you ever would in college. And then you're going to end up having actual real skills that are going to be amazing, you know? So I, I just think it's a huge scam. It's, it's overpriced. I really feel for business and entrepreneurship, the way of the future is 100% not going to be college. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? So a, you were very fortunate to grow up in the Midwest with true parents who love supported and were able to provide a way of life for you. Yep. And then you were also capable of aligning yourself with athletes throughout your tenure in college that right. then set you up for alignment to meet other great people, which were, in your story, the three businessmen who right. ventured and you learned from them. But for ordinary Joes, we'll say. Right. Or Jones, well, if that's the thing, male, female, then we don't have that opportunity. Well, here's the deal. With, true, so so my, my biggest privilege is that I had two parents who sacrificed a ton to raise me to give me a great life, right? I still had student loans, you know, and I, and I had <laughs> fucking student loans, you know. But but that was my biggest privilege. A good family, parents who cared, parents who pushed me. But they pushed me down. They very much pushed me down traditional education. So I think that's probably what I repel because now I look at, like, what I learned and what I'm doing, and it's like it doesn't make sense. However, I would tell you this. Anybody out there, I don't care who you are, where you are, you have social media, you have, like, you can learn so much from YouTube, you can learn so much online, right? And if you have a burning desire, like what you have to have is a burning desire. If you have a burning desire for change, for more to learn, you can sit there every day and message entrepreneurs, message anyone in the world. And if you do that enough times, and there's enough occurrences, you're going to get somebody who says, yeah, come meet me come talk to me. You know, like I've had people reach out to me and, you know, it was probably more in the health and fitness world where like they saw what I was doing and they wanted to start that business. And, you know, I would probably ignore, ignore, ignore. Okay. Like this fucking guy is relentless. Like I kind of appreciate that. It's annoying, but I appreciate that. So I'll reach out to him. Right. So I would say this, like with, if you have a phone, if you have access to the internet, any, anyone can achieve that if they have a burning desire. Because all they have to do is relentlessly reach out to somebody and ask for help. And you'd be surprised that, like, some of the most successful people I know, like, they will help you if you, if, or you have to figure out a way to add value, right? So I have a different, I have a different video I did on this where it's like, I hate when people say, can I pick your brain? You know, like, like, that's just annoying. Like, it happens all the time. But if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I really want to learn from you. What can I do to add value to get time with you? whoa, okay, now I'm going to talk to that person, right? Hey, what are you good at? Okay, you're good at social media. All right, here's the deal. Why don't you help me with this thing? Or you're good at marketing or you're good at whatever. Yeah, why don't you come chat on me on these meetings, help me with this thing. And then if you do that for me, I'd be happy to coach you, happy to teach you, you know? So, I mean, I think don't ever have the limiting belief, like no matter who's out there, who, whoever's seen this, like if you have the internet, like you, you, you could find somebody who's willing to talk to you, you know, who's willing to help you, you know? So I don't know. That's my, that's, that's my thought is like, you just have to be relentless and you just have to ask the right way. And I think the best way is like offer value, you know, and you can even just ask them, Hey, is there anything of value I could offer you to get time with you? Terry, one of the things that you talk about is wealth and something that we more commonly associate with wealth is credit, right? People are yeah. either cash cash wealthy or credit wealthy. Yep. What is your take on the credit score? So first of all, I think as you progress in life and as you, whether it be anything, fitness, nutrition, wealth, real estate, whatever, relationship, whatever it be, like as you, as you learn and learn and learn, I think you, you get to the next level and you start to see things or understand things that like super successful people teach you or know, but the masses don't know. And so there's something that would be called like contrarian thinking, right? Like there's a lot of contrarian thinking at the very top. And most people 
are too caught up in what the masses are doing. And so they're not open to contrarian thinking. They're not open. They're not open to thinking that maybe this isn't right. Maybe there's a different way. Mm-hmm. Like whether it be like the food pyramid or traditional medicine or whatever. Like so many people are indoctrinated, right? So the credit score, in my opinion, my whole life, I was scared. Like, oh shit, I better pay this bill because it's going to affect my credit <laughs> score, right? Like, I better do this because it's going to affect my credit score. And for the average person, hundred percent matters, right? When you go to buy a car, when you go to buy a house, the credit score, right? But a credit score, all it is, is like a report card. Like, are you doing the, are you doing the right things? Like, are you paying your bills on time, right? It, it's not really an indicator of wealth at all. Because, um, and I, and I kind of learned this the hard way, because most of my life I was, like, so scared and so fixated on it. And then I kind of realized when I met, like, all these multimillionaires in the real estate world, and even now when I look at myself, like, I laugh at it because I'm like, oh, my God, I was so fixated on the wrong shit. Because now, when I go to a bank, they don't give a shit about my credit score. They want to know, they want to know my cash flow and my assets, right? So they want to know like how much, how much equity do I have in my places and what is my cash flow, right? So my credit score used to be like over 800, and it got down to like six something because I have all these freaking mortgages, and I have business credit cards and or, well, personal credit cards and business credit cards. I think business might not even show up on your on your personal credit score. But I have so many entities that I have to have some personal credit cards that are used for business. So if you pull my credit, like if the average person who didn't know what I did pull my credit, be like, oh, my God, this guy always has a bunch of debt. Well, it just depends on what day of the month you pull it, <laughs> because our businesses might have one hundred thousand dollars without any debt that's getting paid off tomorrow. So the point is. People who are really wealthy, who really understand financial literacy will tell you that the credit score is like, doesn't mean anything really. Now for the average person, like I said, it does, but if you're really creating wealth, nobody's going to ask for it. Like once you get to a certain point, nobody gives a shit because all it means is, you know, how much debt do you have? Have you not paid things, you know, whatever. So when you get to that next level, people want to know, what's your cash flow? What's your residual streams of income, passive income? How many streams of income do you have? And really the marker is your balance sheet, which shows your, your assets and liabilities and it shows your net worth. So once you get a net worth, I would say over, over a million, for example, like the credit score kind of goes out the window and it just becomes like, eh, whatever. 